This session is covering secure port supply. And basically, uh, this is going to be a nice little view into kind of where we're going from a planning standpoint of what the industry can do to promote business continuity during a foreign animal disease outbreak. So if we got classical swine fever, African swine fever, uh, foot and mouth, um, this is the things that producers could potentially uh, uh, get involved with to actually help them be able to continue to move their pigs uh, during an outbreak, which is a new area. And so uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Jim Roth. He's a Clarence Hartley Cobalt Distinguished Professor in the Department of Veterinary Microbiology and Preventative Medicine at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State University. One of my old professors, that's where I went to vet school, go clones. <laughs> He's also an adjunct professor, uh, professor at the Department of Epidemiology in the College of Public Health uh, at the University of Iowa. He received his DVM in 1975 uh, from Iowa State University and got his PhD there as well in 1981. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Food Security and Public Health and uh, the Institute for International Cooperation in Animal Biologics. I'd like to welcome Jim to the podium to talk about secure port supply. All right. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> so we've been working uh, for about two and a half or three years now on the secure pork supply, working with funding from USDA and the National Pork Board, and working in conjunction with the, the swine industry, the state animal health officials, federal animal health officials, and other university personnel on how we might respond to a foreign animal disease outbreak um, in such a way to keep the industry going. Uh, you're probably aware of the foot and mouth disease, the typical response. Well, the plan we've had and other countries had for many years was just you stamp out the disease by killing all the animals and all the animals that might be infected, all the infected and potentially infected animals, uh, and you stop all movement until the outbreak is over. And we'll go into that, but we really can't do that in modern uh, U.S. animal agriculture. So we need different plans. And we need to make sure we don't stamp out the industry while we're trying to stamp out the disease. So this has been an active planning process. And if you were here for the porcine epidemic diarrhea talk right before this, uh, that is a virus that had never been in this country before, and suddenly it's here, and it's here in a lot of places very rapidly. And we have to worry that the same thing could happen with these diseases that Patrick mentioned. Fortunately, PED uh, does not have an impact on trade. Um, with uh, FMD, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, African swine fever, we'd lose all of our export markets until we get it under control. So the, the U.S. animal agriculture is highly vulnerable to these listed foreign animal diseases. Our production animals have no immunity to foreign animal diseases because we don't have the disease here and we don't vaccinate for those diseases. So once it gets here, it can spread rapidly. There's no immunity. Uh, export markets will be lost and prices will drop dramatically because we can't export um, pork anymore. And there will be stop movement orders issued. In order to control these diseases, you need to stop the movement of animals. Or we're proposing you need to control the movement of animals. It's pretty difficult to completely stop. And <clears throat> One of the first things we would want to do in an outbreak of any size at all is to vaccinate. But we don't have nearly enough vaccine uh, ready to go for, for these diseases. So vaccine won't be a tool that will be available within the first weeks or months at the level we would want it to be available. And the, the U.S. animal ag industry has changed dramatically, as you're all aware, in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, the size, structure, efficiency, and extensive movement inherent in U.S. livestock industries will present unprecedented challenges in the event of a foreign animal disease outbreak. No country with the size uh, of animal agriculture industry and the structure that we have has ever had to deal with foot and mouth disease. It'll, it'll be an unprecedented challenge. Uh, a few facts and figures. This is uh, total U.S. pork exports and value in billions uh, over the last 10 years. And you can see the industry has been extremely successful in increasing the exports. And that's great for the industry, but the more we increase our exports, the more vulnerable we become to those exports being shut off uh, on the day of an outbreak. You can see there was a little decline between 2008 and 2009 
That was the H1N1 pandemic influenza that was called swine flu and had a big impact on pork prices. Uh, you can imagine if with that drop, remember what that drop did and imagine what this dropping clear down would do to the industry. And it's not just uh, pork. We, for foot and mouth disease, that affects cattle too. So the beef exports would be lost. Here's exports in 2003 was 3.8 billion. Then we had one case of mad cow disease and the beef exports dropped dramatically and it took a long time to get it back. Uh, we're having great success in exporting beef also. If we get FMD, there'll be a lot of extra pork and beef. Uh, we're all, all gonna need to eat four meals a day to, to keep up with getting, getting this eaten. <clears throat> So, as you know, modern swine production in the U.S. is very efficient, produces high-quality product, and depends on extensive movement of swine. The, in the intensive industry, you've got to keep those animals moving. A stop movement order for swine will quickly lead to overcrowding conditions with serious animal welfare and health issues if, if there's a total stop movement. Uh, this shows the uh, concept of pig flow in, in modern in intensive swine production, um, breeding gestation to farrowing, uh, weaned pigs, maybe go to a nursery, and then to finishing, and then to market. Uh, there's about half a million pigs and sows go to slaughter every day, go to market. If you shut this off, then this you've got to imagine that this is a moving conveyor belt. You, you stop it here and everything piles up. Uh, or you stop it at any one of these points. It, it's a, a living organism. that We've got to allow it to continue to move, or we've, we've really got... Uh, an unmanageable problem. Uh, and another change in the last 20 years has been the extensive movement of hogs being born in one place, finished in another. Um, in 1990, there were 4.3 million pigs that went from one state to another state. Now, in a year's time, it's about 40 million pigs in the U.S. go from one state to another state, change states of residence. Um, and this is for Iowa. About 22.5 million of those 40 are pigs coming into Iowa from out of state. And many of these cross multiple state borders. The, the, state, the states control their own borders. Uh, each state animal health official or governor can say, we have FMD, we're going to close our borders. No animals can cross our border. Uh, if that happens, we, we've really got a lot of pileup of animals on the wrong side of the border in places where they can't really be uh, handled. <clears throat> and the swine industry is very diverse in the U.S., and this complicates it. Uh, the uh, largest number of operations, 48.7 thousand hog operations, have less than 100 pigs. So the vast majority of producers have less than 100 pigs. However, 62% of the inventory is in 3,300 operations with over 5,000 pigs. And if we get one of these diseases in, you have to manage it. It's all, all of these. We don't get rid of the disease until it's out of all of these types of operations. Very different uh, management practices, strategies, very different biosecurity uh, in the different types of production units. And feral swine. That's something new that we didn't have to deal with the last time we had classical swine fever, hog cholera, which was eradicated in the late 70s. Uh, foot and mouth disease we haven't had since 1929. Uh, and the, the industry is totally different. It's estimated there's about 5 million feral swine. Um, and they've gone, this is 1982, 2004, 2010. They're growing in number and moving, moving north. Um, and especially the the smaller producers with less than 100 pigs may not have great biosecurity between the feral swine and, and the pigs in their operation. So all of these things are changing and it makes the industry vulnerable. So we've started working on the Secure Pork Supply Plan, as I said, funded by USDA and by National Pork Board. And the first thing we're focusing on is developing procedures to allow the safe movement of animals with no evidence of infection in a foreign animal disease control zone to a pork processing plant or to other sites to accommodate different stages of production. So how can we keep those animals moving 
How can we confirm that this site is negative or doesn't seem to be positive so that the animals can move uh, and go to slaughter or to the next stage of production? That's our first focus. So we have a planning committee made up of federal and state officials, representatives of all phases of the industry, producers, packers, um, truckers, every, all phases of the industry, National Pork Board, NPPC, and Swine Veterinarian Group, and then two universities are, are working with this. We had our first meeting in October 2011, and we formed uh, eight working groups to focus on uh, biosecurity before and after the outbreak, what would the recommended biosecurity be? Uh, and w what we would like to see happen is producers voluntarily adopt the biosecurity and surveillance uh, and data management practices ahead of the outbreak so that in the outbreak they are more prepared to quickly move animals if they voluntarily adopt these procedures. Uh, then there's the level two biosecurity, which is more stringent biosecurity that would be implemented on the day of, of the outbreak to increase biosecurity further. So we're planning on providing advice on biosecurity, on surveillance, testing, and sampling. Uh, compartmentalization and monitored premises is a designation you need from the incident command system, the federal and state officials, to allow you to move your animals. You have to be designated as a monitored premises and, and meet the biosecurity and surveillance standards. If you do plan for that ahead of time, you'll be in much better shape in the event of the outbreak. Um, data collection management and sharing is a, is a big issue that we're working on. Then there are risk assessments to, to base these uh, recommendations on, and those take a long time and are just getting going. Public communication. Um, I'll show you in a minute. The, the diseases we're talking about are not food safety risks. They're not public health risks. So we've got to communicate this to the public. Don't, don't worry about eating the meat or being around the animals. You won't get sick from these three diseases that we're talking about. And then a plan for a response to an outbreak tomorrow. A lot of these will take a long time to implement. What if we get it on, you know, tomorrow, like PED showed up suddenly? And we've got to deal with it right away, so before these plans are in place. So we've decided to include four diseases in the plan. Uh, foot and mouth disease, and that affects all ruminants, all cloven-hoofed animals. Uh, so not only swine, but cattle, sheep, goats, deer uh, are susceptible. Uh, classical swine fever, which is hog cholera, uh, we eradicated in 78, I think it was, only affects pigs. African swine fever only affects pigs. Uh, and then swine vesicular disease isn't a real big concern, except it looks like foot and mouth disease. You get lesions. So if we find it, we need to get rid of it. Uh, it probably wouldn't spread as fast and be as big of a deal. But uh, FMD is a really, really difficult one because it is the most contagious disease of animals, and it affects uh, so many species. <clears throat> So we, we decided to look at all four of these because they have some things in common. Um, they're not public health concerns. They're not food safety concerns. And we've really got to emphasize that. Um, they're spread by direct contact and oral exposure. Those are the most important routes of infection in pigs. Uh, pigs are relatively resistant to airborne infection. It can occur, but they're relatively resistant. So that, that helps. Uh, it's also on fomites. Contaminant, you know, dirty trucks, dirty boots, anything can spread this from one farm to another. So biosecurity is going to be really important. A complication with foot and mouth disease is pigs exhale large concentrations of the virus. They, they exhale plumes of viruses. So a, a big uh, group of pigs will exhale massive amounts of FMD virus, and cattle are highly susceptible to aerosolized virus. So the pigs become a uh, threat to the cattle industry um, because of that, if they become infected. And as I mentioned, the, the way the world has planned to handle FMD is stamping out. You kill all the infected animals, all the animals in contact premises nearby, uh, within 24 hours, preferably, or maybe 48 hours. And you'd have to do it quickly because you do it to stop the spread of disease. Um, 
And it's the major disease preventing trade of animals and animal products worldwide. Any country with FMD has a lot of trouble exporting their products. Uh, the, U the UK had a big outbreak in 2001. You probably remember big piles of burning cattle, and they, they killed a lot of cattle, uh, six million animals, I think it was, to get rid of it. And they only have a very small fraction of the animals we have. Uh, South Korea had an outbreak recently. They killed a third of the pigs in the country, and then finally decided they were going to have to vaccinate. Uh, and, and finally have gotten that under control with vaccine. Japan, Japan had a big outbreak. These three countries have a veterinary infrastructure about like ours. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to handle. Egypt is continuously infected, but they got a new strain in. The problem with foot and mouth disease is there's at least 24 different strains that you need a different vaccine for each strain. It's one of the reasons we can't vaccinate now. You don't know which strain you're going to get in. Uh, Egypt was vaccinating for three or four strains, and then a new strain came in and, and killed a lot of the animals, even though they were vaccinating, because it didn't cover that strain. So FMD, typically, the mortality is low. Not, adult animals don't usually die from it. Very young pigs and calves can die from it. It depends on the strain. But the mortality is low if you let it go through your herd, typically. The, more, the high mortality is associated with the control methods. The stamping out leads to very high mortality because you kill everything. And it's out there. FMD, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, sets the rules on trade in animals and animal products. There are 178 member countries, including the U.S. 66, or about a third of those, are free of FMD. 11 have free... Countries have part of the country that's free and part that's not, and, and you can be free with or without vaccination. 96 countries are endemic and have never been free of FMD. And five countries that had been free for a very long time recently had a reemergence. So it's out there in most of the world, and we've just been amazingly lucky it hasn't come in with all of the travel and commerce, uh, inter international travel and commerce. So I mentioned the U.S. animal agriculture industry is unique. We have very, very large herds. Uh, feedlots, um, 50, up to 50,000 or more cattle per feedlot. Uh, dairies with 5,000 cows, lactating cows per dairy. Calf ranches where they, they take uh, day-old calves from the dairy, put them, take them to the calf ranch, raise them until they're four months of age, and then move them either the males go to feedlots, the females go to heifer raisers, or back to the dairy. Um, and, and this is in the Central Valley of California. I visited a calf ranch. They're getting in hundreds of calves every day, uh, raising them to four months, sending hundreds of calves out every day. Uh, you can imagine if we tried to do that in the swine industry. We commingle all the young animals and then send them back to where they came from. Uh, and, and sow farms with greater than 20,000 sows. No way we can kill these in 24 to 48 hours. It would take days to, to kill 50,000 feedlot cattle. Then you've got to dispose of them, and there's no way to dispose of them. So we pretty much have to give up on stamping out um, if it gets into these large units. And extensive mobility. It's estimated there are about a million swine in trucks every day in the US. About half of those are going to slaughter and about half of those are going from one stage of production to the next. So on day one, when we issue a stop movement, uh, you can stop moving any new animals, but you've got about a million pigs on trucks. Uh, some of those will have come from the control zone. And then a lot of cattle are moving. We don't have as good a numbers in cattle, but um, depending on the time of year, there's up to 83,000 feedlot placements per day, cattle going into feedlots. About 94,000 commercial cattle are slaughtered every day, so those are on trucks going to slaughter plants. Extensive movement of dairy calves and replacement heifers, and we haven't been able to find data on that. Then there's the auction markets, fairs, exhibitions, where animals are commingled and, and then go, go back out again. Uh, and then sheep and goats, the movement of those animals too. So very extensive movement. Uh, many of us believe that by the time we find out we have one of these diseases, it will have moved pretty extensively already. So the strategies for the response to and management of a foreign animal disease outbreak will 
need to change as the outbreak progresses. And it'll depend on the magnitude, the location, and other characteristics of the outbreak. So when an outbreak starts, it'll be, we found one positive farm. We have no idea how many other farms might be positive. And at that point, you've got to do everything you can to stamp it out, because maybe that's the only one. Um, but then as the outbreak progresses, if you find out it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you've got to change your strategies. So we've developed what we call the phases and types of an FMD outbreak. Uh, the first phase is a heightened alert phase if Canada or Mexico gets foot and mouth disease. All of North America is free. Canada and Mexico are free. Uh, if one of them goes positive, then we need to be ready because it, we do a lot of trade with those two countries. Phase one is from the time the first case is found in the U.S. until reasonable evidence is available to estimate how big the outbreak is. And that should be no more than four days before we have an idea of how big the outbreak is. During that phase, we would want to stamp out everything we can that, that's infected just in case it's a small outbreak. Phase two is the time period where we know how big it is and we're trying to get rid of it. And that'd be a very long phase, probably. Phase three is the recovery, where we think we've got the foot and mouth disease under control, and you have to do surveillance on all of the herds within the control zone, perhaps all of the U.S., to prove that it's not, that we've gotten rid of it. Very extensive surveillance. Phase four is we're declared free of FMD, maybe with vaccination, and we have to convince our trading partners that we don't have FMD so that they will begin to accept our product again. So that's the phase, which is temporal. Then there's the type of outbreak, and this is, goes from a small focal outbreak to a catastrophic U.S. outbreak where the whole U.S. is positive or catastrophic North American where U.S., Mexico, and Canada are all positive. And the response changes as the outbreak gets bigger. If it stays as a type 1 small outbreak, we can stamp it out, and, and that's what would happen. Once it gets into a moderate regional outbreak, um, if some of those hard herds are too big or too many herds are affected, we won't be able to continue stamping out. Uh, we would then want to start using ring vaccination, vaccinate around the area, and, and try and suppress it. If it becomes a large regional outbreak um, or a widespread national outbreak, if we have a lot of vaccine, we might be able to get it under control somewhat. If we don't have vaccine, which we won't for in the foreseeable future, uh, then it might become a catastrophic U.S. outbreak. Um, and if that happens, we say, this is not an emergency response anymore. FMD is one more disease we have to deal with. We've lost our exports. We can't, it's going to take a long time to get those back. Um, but, it, but it's not an emergency response. It becomes a program disease that we work towards eradicating over a long period of time. <clears throat> so what are the t tools for controlling FMD if we get it here? Um, stop movement where you stop moving animals so they don't spread disease, biosecurity to keep it out of the farms, stamping out where you slaughter all clinically affected and in contact susceptible animals within 24 or 48 hours, trace back and trace forward. You find an infected farm, you want to know everything that came onto that farm in the last two incubation periods, which is 28 days. And everything that left that farm, where did it go in the last 28 days? So you can trace and find where it may have spread to. You need a very large amount of very rapid diagnostics and vaccination. Uh, vaccinate to kill where you kill all the animals you've vaccinated. Um, and it could be by slaughtering them and eating them, or it could be by disposing of them. Because if we vaccinate to live, the vaccinated animals live, it takes longer to get your... Uh, FMD free status back. Um, so those, these are the tools that, that are used in a big outbreak. But the only one that we're going to be able to really count on is biosecurity. So it'll be down to the, the producers uh, implementing biosecurity to protect their own herds, just like we do for any other disease. It's the producer's responsibility to keep it out. Um, 
We won't be able to stop movement for any period of time without having to kill a lot of animals. We won't be able to stamp out large herds. This trace back, trace forward takes extensive uh, personnel. Um, we could overwhelm our diagnostic laboratories pretty quick with all the testing. And we won't have enough vaccine. So. so then how can we have a plan for controlled movement? And that's what I'm going to spend the next few minutes on. So given all of these problems, on day one, um, when there's a, we would like a total stop movement, uh, and it, on day one, it probably would be a total stop movement at the beginning, so no new movements would be initiated. Don't put any more pigs on trucks on day one. Stop moving everything. But we've got about a million pigs on the road every day, and we have to find a soft landing for those pigs. Uh, some of them will come from the control area, but we don't really know the size of the control area yet, so you've got to be suspicious of, of a lot of those. Um, in, in about, as I said, about half of those are going to slaughter. So what do we do? We say don't put any new pigs on trucks. What do we do with the ones already on trucks? And we'll talk about that. And then we have to restart the movement after a few days, or, or pigs are piling up and there's no place to put them. And how do we restart the movement? And that'll depend on how big the outbreak is. So, uh, first of all, controlled movement through a packing facility. The previous plan was that if you have a possible FMD positive animal in a packing plant, you sh shut down the packing plant. We're recommending something different. Um, Swine can be infected with FMD virus before showing any clinical signs or even testing positive by PCR, by laboratory testing. It's like any other disease. You can, you can have it for a little while before you look sick or before the lab tests are positive. So you can never say for sure this animal's negative or this herd is negative. What you can say is there's no evidence of infection and they, they're healthy, but they might be incubating it. It's not possible to prove freedom from FMD infection in a herd or in an individual animal. It's only possible to establish the lack of evidence of infection. Therefore, all pork from a processing facility that has received swine from the control area will be considered to be potentially to potentially contain the virus because of because of these two facts. We can't be absolutely sure it doesn't have virus. However, FMD is not a public health or food safety problem. So if, um, animals that pass anti-mortem and post-mortem inspection by food safety inspection service are safe for human consumption, even if they might be in the preclinical stage of FMD. We've got safeguards in place. We can have animals going to slaughter that are might have PERS virus, will almost certainly have PCV2 virus, other endemic diseases. As long as they're healthy, they're safe to eat. And these are not food safety viruses. So it's a big message we have to get to the public. This, uh, the meat coming out of these plants, even though it's safe for human consumption, if it's uncooked garbage is fed to pigs, pigs are very susceptible to oral transmission. So we've got, we should stop feeding all garbage. In Iowa, it's illegal to feed garbage. Some states allow garbage feeding of cooked garbage um, because it, it can transmit any of these three diseases, uh, African swine fever, classical swine fever, FMD. Even though the, it came from a healthy pig and the food is safe, it can transmit to pigs. At the beginning of an outbreak on day one, packing our recommendation is that packing plants should continue to process all swine in the plant and in transit to the plant, which cannot be turned back or euthanized while in transit. And state animal health officials should not stop animals from crossing state lines. Otherwise, you've got a lot of pigs trapped on the wrong side of the state line in trucks. And what's the neighboring state going to do with those? And if you close your border, your neighboring state's going to close their border, and you've got pigs trapped on your side of the state line. So we're wanting an education and, and discussion process with state animal health officials to, to work through this decision. During a large outbreak, type 3 or greater, 
Um, Market-ready hogs and sows from herds in the control area with no evidence of infection should be sent to slaughter as quickly as possible. So they're, it's like clearing the, the dead timber from a forest fire. You want to get those out of the area so they're not a source of, of infection and to, and to salvage them. Uh, processing of swine should continue even if it's known that FMD infected animals have been in the plant. And that's a new, new recommendation. Um, federal and state officials would need to agree to this. We've got to talk about this and the implications of it with state and federal animal health officials so they understand the problems and the issues and would agree to it. And the packing facility owners and managers also need to agree to this. But if we have a half a million animals going to slaughter every day and the packing plant stops taking them, what are you going to do with all those finished pigs and sows on trucks? Uh, there's no place for them to go. And the big packing plants might have larage for 5,000 animals that are waiting to go through because they're processing 15 to 20,000 a day. Um, you, those animals stop where they're at and they become susceptible to infection. If they're already infected, they get a full-blown infection. So um, given the realistic situation in this country, we're, we're making these recommendations. Um, <clears throat> modern packing facilities process thousands of swine daily. It, you know, as I mentioned, at any time, there's a lot of animals waiting in larage. They're incubating the virus. It's going to blow up. And all those in trucks have nowhere to go. <clears throat> And processing the healthy animals through slaughter is the fastest way to dispose of those animals and presents the lowest risk of spreading FMD compared to the other options. Reduces the need for carcass disposal and preserves high quality protein for human consumption. However, if the packing plant has positive animals or even might have positive animals, they become uh, a risk for spreading infection. So packing plant employees and service personnel and truck drivers have to observe uh, increased biosecurity to avoid transmitting the virus when they leave the plant. All potential fomites or contaminated objects leaving the plant have to be cleaned and disinfected. Be very difficult to implement on day one in an emergency in a, in a large packing plant. So ideally, the plants would have a plan for implementing biosecurity in place before the outbreak. And it doesn't matter whether they keep processing pigs or not. If they have FMD positive animals, they're going to need to do that on day one anyway. They're going to have to have that biosecurity to avoid spreading, spreading the viruses widely. Then you've got a restart movement. So we stop all movement. We land the pigs that are in trucks. And after a few days, when the situation is better understood, we have to have a plan to start moving the animals again. And that will, uh, the recommendation is that producers who want to move their animals need to implement level two biosecurity. And we're, these are drafted and defined and will soon be available for review by, by producers. And the haulers and the packers all need to implement biosecurity. We need a lot of surveillance to find out where the viruses are. Traceability of animals, got to have traceability, validated um, PREM IDs. And, and before they get on a truck, we have to, they have to be examined to show there's no evidence of infection. And there are various ways to do that. Maybe laboratory testing, maybe an accredited veterinarian examines the pigs before they get on the truck um, to make sure they're still healthy. And then movement permits. You, to move, you have to have a permit from the, the officials running the outbreak. Um, so you have to meet these things in order to get your movement permit. And then we've got to manage all that data, and we need better electronic methods for doing that. So problems to address, big, big problems. Uh, will the pork-consuming public accept the product? Um, will packers be willing to continue to process animals from a control area in a large outbreak? One of the concerns is that early in the outbreak, some Packers may say, well, I'm only taking pigs from the free area, so my meat is better than the meat from the other packer. Three or four days later, they may be taking meat from an infected area, and they're going to wish they hadn't said that. So we want to get this messaging all together beforehand. 
Will state animal health officials allow animals to cross state lines? That's up to every state to decide. Um, if we stop stamping out, what do we do with the herds that are infected that we've let recover? Um, how many of those might be so sick they have to be euthanized? And how, do, how long do we let them recover? Feed efficiency is going to be very bad. The price of pork is going to be much lower. Uh, what are the economics of production for uninfected herds and for infected herds uh, if this should occur? And one of the big problems we have, I've mentioned a couple times, is we don't have enough vaccine in the stockpile. Uh, there's a small stockpile of foot and mouth disease vaccine for North America, U.S., Mexico, Canada. No stockpile for classical swine fever and vaccine. And nowhere in the world is there a vaccine for African swine fever. There's no effective vaccine. So for FMD especially, we really need to ramp up our, our stockpile of, of vaccines. 